Hello, everyone. <laughs> so welcome. Oh, welcome. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? I'm speaking, I'm speaking into the phone right here. Right here. So welcome everyone. welcome, everyone. Welcome to our Tippy McMichael lecture. Mick this is our second this one. Second one. Uh, we had one last uh, night as well. Uh, and if you missed it, you it's missed on the it, YouTube, YouTube channel, channel so you can watch it. So you can watch it. Um, my name is Denise Greathouse, and I just want to say a few things about the Tippy McMichael uh, lecture series before we start. Um, Tippy's full name was Clifton Reed McMichael, and she was a lifelong member of the church here, as were her grandparents. Um, at her death, she left a bequest of one-third of her estate, which was approximately $1.5 million, to enhance the life and work of the church. So the Tippy McMichael Lecture Series was created from her gift as an expression of thanksgiving and as a memorial to her. The series is funded from St. Paul's Permanent Endowment Fund, and additional support is provided from occasional donations from parishioners and friends of the church. The lecture series are an offering to the community from which St. Paul's draws its life. They are intended to explore a wide range of spiritual issues and to feature accomplished speakers from varied disciplines and different religious traditions. So tonight, or today, since it's not night, <laughs> last night anymore, um, this morning we are very privileged and honored, honored to have Principal Chief Jeffrey Standing Bear here as our guest and speaker. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Evan now. Thank you. Uh, every once in a while, I have to pinch myself uh, to, to, to make sure that I'm not dreaming. I have such a great job, and a part of that is spending time with amazing people. And I got a chance to spend some time with Chief Standing Bear yesterday. Um, and I said a little bit about his role as the principal chief of the Osage Nation, and I got to hear him talk about it with just love and affection and warmth. But today what I want to highlight for you is that I have heard, even in just less than 24 hours, I have heard Chief Standing Bear go out of his way to lift up and celebrate the contributions of everybody he has encountered. He's the kind of leader that wants the people around him to know that they are gifted and that they have gifts to share a deep sense of gratitude and respect and celebration. He's drawn it out of me. It's a wonderful thing to be around someone who sees that in other people and helps us see it too. Uh, in some of the stories that he has told, I've gotten just a, a tiny glimpse, a tiny glimpse of the way that must be unfolding in his work as principal chief and in his life. And I'm so grateful he's here to share that with us. Um, we will finish right at 10 o'clock or, or right at 11 o'clock or right before it. So in case I don't get to remind you of it, there are two ways that we are following up to this visit as a parish. One is a book study of the book Killers of the Flower Moon, from which the film, which is to be released this week, is coming out. We will have a book study. If you'd like to be a part of that, you can read more in the insert or find it on our uh, social media and newsletter. I would love for you to sign up. And then I'm really excited that we're taking a field trip to Pahuska to see some of the uh, facilities and the, uh, the, the land that is uh, at the center of the life of the Osage Nation. A chance for us to go and see that part of the world, not that far away, uh, but an important uh, pilgrimage for us to make. And you can also find information about that on your uh, flyer, and I hope you'll sign up and join us. But now join me in welcoming our guest, Principal Chief Jeffrey Standing Bear. Hello. <laughs> Thank you very much uh, and uh, for being here last night and today. I, I really enjoy so much uh, sharing uh, 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 information with uh, good people and you can feel it when you walk in, uh, well, when you meet Evan and everybody, it's, it doesn't take long to figure that out. Uh, I, I wanted to... Uh, start off, though, with thanking the University of Arkansas uh, for uh, <clears throat> making possible, through their advice and technical assistance, some of our food sovereignty 
initiatives, and I talked a little bit about that last night, about how we're striving for self-sufficiency and how we've learned from uh, 200 years of history uh, the, the penalties for uh, not being self-sufficient. And that we were uh, reminded uh, when we hit struck oil, uh, we, were, we were reminded uh, during the COVID, uh, we were, uh, were constantly being reminded. And uh, <clears throat> in our quest for food security, uh, we didn't know where to turn at first, so we, so we w went to the universities, Oklahoma State University, we'd heard University of Arkansas, uh, Kansas State University, and uh, at the University of Arkansas, Dr. Janie Hipp was here, and she's now general counsel for USDA nationally. And Dr. Hipp and her team had been preparing food codes, so, because as we've learned, uh, you know, we, we did put together our greenhouses, uh, we did put together aquaponics farms, we have our meat processing plant. Um, you know, we've done all this uh, uh, you know, from March 2020 when there were, was you know, no meat, there, you know, there, there's no fresh vegetables, and we, we were in a position where we had to do something immediately, no drama allowed, just go, let's all pitch in, let's work together, and the food codes are essential if you're going to put uh, food into commerce. Because once you put food into commerce, there are a lot of requirements. And the legal system, the regulatory system, was just not set up to handle the COVID or the pandemic either. So uh, we, could, uh, we could go through Dr. Hip and her team's work, work at, here at Arkansas and all these sample codes from tribes throughout the United States and recommended laws, take them to our legislatures and uh, work them to fit our uh, formats and talk to our natural resource people, uh, people that are uh, producing food for us and say, is this, is this your area? And if it is, how would you fix it? And within a year, we were able to handle all of that, and, and we were in production in eight months for our meat processing. And as I mentioned last night, now we can do uh, uh, 60, 80 head a, a month of uh, our, our cattle or, or bison, uh, and that's one shift. Um, so, uh, and then in our um, greenhouses, all that's going in, because we're feeding children uh, that there's also federal program money at work and once you uh, accept the federal dollar, any other money you bring in to that program has to also match those requirements. So finding uh, people who understand that process, I'm so proud of everybody that's put it together, made it happen. Uh, they don't need guidance. They realized uh, that uh, they know what to do. And it's, it's not true that if, when you're elected, uh, some uh, ray beam comes down, and all of a sudden, all of a sudden, you're an architect, you're, you're you're a rocket scientist, you're a lawyer, engineer, and they they realize that as well. And we, so we weren't kidding. You you're the experts. We want you to take over, and our job is to support you. And and they they are doing that. Um, now a lot of others are watching. We're in a we're in a zone right now where uh, those who are going to grab the, the, the present and go forward are becoming more and more obvious. Those who are not are becoming more and more obvious. And I want to encourage everybody to pull each other up, work together, because you're going to be around with each other, if God willing, for a while. So, uh, so I wanted to thank the uh, University of Arkansas for that important contribution. Other tribes now have learned about it. Um, and we all have her, her book, and they're, they're still working on it. So that was an essential part of our uh, growth and our uh, quest for survival uh, into the future is the work that was done here. So now let me say uh, uh, my name is uh, Jinga Kahika, uh, child chief of the Wasabe uh, uh, Bear Clan uh, of the Osage. And uh, as I was talking with some of my new friends over here, uh, we've gone through 
a lot of transition. Uh, my uncle Ed Redigal, who uh, studies uh, the histories of the Missouri and, and northern Arkansas uh, and uh, eastern Kansas and Oklahoma, where we live for hundreds of years, has talked to anthropologists, has talked to historians, and his best estimate is that uh, at the time of contact with uh, uh, before Lewis and Clark, uh, there were 200,000 of us, uh, but because of um, w the resistance to disease it just did not exist. We did not have a lot of these diseases. Smallpox, as we all know, was the worst. And our populations dropped into, according to the uh, roles of the federal government and the Jesuit priests, uh, in, in, by 1890, well, the Jesuits were with us until about 1872, uh, and then they were told to stay in Kansas, don't follow the Osages, you guys are helping them too much, write treaties, stuff like that. True, true. And they, were, they were helping us. And uh, so then they shifted us over to Dice and, she, uh, Dice and uh, Priest anyway. So uh, by, by 1890, we were down to uh, 1,500 people. Now, that kind of loss, when nine out of 10 are, are gone in, a, in one lifetime, uh, uh, creates such chaos, such loss of customs, such loss of uh, morale. It's depressing. Uh, grief uh, weakens your body, as we all know. Uh, and so it made the resistance to measles and typhus and everything else just terrible. And we were not at war with the United States. Uh, we were simply uh, outnumbered. And after the Civil War in 1865, the railroads took off, and uh, plus all the, the tribes from Indiana, o Illinois, Ohio were being pushed. In the 1830s, the Cherokee, the five civilized tribes were being pushed. So, uh, but after the Civil War, the uh, uh, millions of people m were shifting, particularly out of the South, because of the devastation that existed there. So we took refuge in, uh, in uh, Oklahoma, and our um, people, our chiefs, and uh, and got together and listened to a, his name is Watianka, um, a prophet, and uh, he said uh, to our chiefs, "Send these uh, warriors out with a lance, and uh, and send one to each direction, uh, but uh, if they want to go west and south, particularly." Uh, tell them that when they, we had to do the four directions, you know, it's a cultural matter, but um, those, those uh, young warriors, if they see ground, uh, have them throw from their horse a lance into the ground, and if the lance uh, stays in the ground, that means there's earth on there, and you could farm there. So they say, pull up your lance and keep moving on because we don't want to, to go and, uh, where the white man will want to farm. And so that was the test. And so they found Osage County very rocky soil, and the lances w would not stay, and they would fall. And so they reported back, and the, the, the uh, chiefs in the council, they said, okay, that's where we're going to go. And so we're, no one will follow us. And uh, then we struck oil. So uh, now here's a movie spoiler alert, and this is a way I'm going to uh, uh, also keep as much as I can uh, the thought with you about our perspective uh, about life and death. Uh, but uh, when we uh, did strike oil, it uh, brought a lot of people in, but right before that, around 1900, 1910, and this movie it takes place in 1921, as those of you who read the book uh, know about this, but around 1900, uh, our um, elders, our ceremonial leaders, our priests, uh, and the people uh, said, we've got to uh, grab hold of what we can keep, because we've lost so much. Uh, 
it, we don't even know what we've lost. But we do know a lot of our ceremonies, um, large and small, cannot be completed because the people of those clans, those 24 clans, those clans are extinct. They're gone. So um, I know the last one, uh, the major one, was in 1910 in Greyhorse, the community. And they called that the creation story, uh, where how, how we come to be. And they went from clan priest to clan priest to clan priest. And then there was no one in the, that seat for that clan. It was gone and gone and gone. And you can't tell the story without the complete story. And so um, within this ceremonial structure, uh, which is highly centralized, and it was organized to sky people and earth people. And so, uh, like, I'm a, I'm a bear clan, so I'm on the earth side, the hunka side. Um, and then on the um, side of the sky people, we have uh, thunder people, the elder star people, and, and then if, you know, and so forth. And then as it gets into more details, you get into um, over the star, elder star people, the sun carrier people. Their area is that, uh, call it uh, the, you know, the motion, the movement of the stars and the moon, the sun. Call it gravity, call it what you want. Uh, that is um, their area, that's their job. In a bear clan, we had our job. And everybody in there are, uh, uh, we had four eagle clans, but um, this, we have uh, three functioning now. Say the Tsisho Washtake, that's the gentle eagle people. Um, the Washtake is that part of the eagle tail, or you know, that's soft, that soft down. That's Washtake. And Tsisho is the sky people. Well, that's where we got a lot of our doctors and, 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 and like that. Then the other eagle, the hunka eagle, the bald eagle people, they, all their names are, um, uh, have to do with uh, the hunting prowess of the eagle and the eyesight of the eagle. And so you start with this uh, earth and sky, peace and war, uh, although it's so complicated, um, uh, my wife is a sun carrier clan, uh, but that's a war clan of the, of the sky people. So it's not what you would normally think, but it's so alien to the way people in these societies from the West or even from the East, from China and so forth, that it's unique. And the, the, the tribes of, of the, na the native people of this hemisphere developed these systems uh, without any influence from uh, those uh, on the other side of the Atlantic or Pacific. So we have very, very, very similar views. We, uh, almost all of us have a role for cedar. Um, and um, I, I can tell you that um, in our sweat lodges and in our other ceremonies, um, when, we, when, if you, when you're buried, uh, those ceremonies we kept even though we have knowledge of the others, we don't use them. Because as I said last night, half our people don't even live in Oklahoma. They're scattered. And, and they, you know, I've met Osages that write uh, beautiful poems about, uh, about where I live. And uh, they haven't been, when I first of all, I said, Did, have they ever been here? <laughs> and no, the answer is no. They, they've uh, three generations, and they live in California, and never been here. And uh, nice poems, though. <laughs> so, so, see, it isn't so bad here. Look. <laughs> so, so, um, but, um, so our people uh, uh, try to uh, live as much as we can with these clans, live as much as we can with these names, and, uh, and, but in this modern world. And let me uh, just uh, uh, get right to the part about living within what's left, we try to keep certain uh, uh, ropes or strands of history alive, because now we know we can't do a lot of things. 
It's just like uh, uh, the mass. Uh, if you were nine out of ten were gone and your priest were gone, you say, well, we want to have we want to have the holy mass. Well, who's going to lead this? So, uh, you, so what you have to do, like we've done, I believe you're going to have to do, is come together as a community, as Christianity did in the very beginning, and and basically start over. Even though you want someone says, well, I think my grandma said they used to do this at this time and this at that time. Someone else says, no, they didn't. My grandmother said this and that. And we have a lot of that. <laughs> okay? So it's up to somebody to finally make the decisions. So instead of seven rites on the, on the funeral, we reduced it to four and uh, that are manageable, that people... They didn't put obligations on people to have further ceremonies afterwards or go into mourning for a full year uh, where you can't go to the movies, can't go, you can go to the grocery store and back and you can't have friends over, nothing like that. It's a, this is a whole protocol. So what we try to do is, is get to what we think we know. Right? And when we do that, we're reminded about we say our names, but who we are, the older uh, people that have gone on say, well, I say, well, how do you say Osage? They say, well, that's from the word Wajaje. And the uh, Wajaje is uh, uh, when the uh, French uh, uh, said that, uh, the English took that and that O-U-Z, and they, the way the French wrote it, and it looked like Osage. So, so uh, but actually, uh, the Wajaje is what the French call this because a, a priest named Marquette, Father Marquette, uh, ran into us up on the Missouri River and asked one of our clans, who, the, and Wajaje means name givers, by the way. That's co- maybe it's not a coincidence, right? Probably not. Um, said, um, who are you? They said, Wajaje. That's the clan. Uh, so th- we call ourselves Wajaje to this day. But our religious leaders said, said really, we're Nika Shinka. I said, Nika is a, a person, and uh, Shinka is little. So we're little, we're little people. Little people? No, no. There you go, thinking like a white man again. That's what they used to tell me, those old full bloods. And they, they say it just to, uh, you know, realize we've got to change our thinking here to the way they think. So that Nikashi, that's a, a humble person. We're humble people. We try to be humble. And that opens the door when you start listening to them about what does that mean. And then they t- would always pray and they'd say, uh, we're uh, pitiful. We're pitiful people. And this was a th- common theme every single day and night. Uh, the uh, Osage people would, would say, those that would follow that path, one of those strands we have left, would say, we're Nika Jinka. We're, we're, we're so small in the universe, so small in the minds of, 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 of everyone that we're, we're pitiful. We're pitiful because we're human. That's our condition. So we have to turn to prayer to help us. That was the constant message that we heard uh, growing up until those people, and to this day, are surviving. A new, they were a young generation once, and, but now they're the elders, and uh, they're teaching that. And some, some of this, uh, these younger folks are coming right up. And part of that, learning what that means, is... Um, um, you can see uh, in uh, some of the writings of the 1820s, 1830s, uh, there's a book, Tixier's uh, Journey on the Plains, uh, where he, Osages are in there. Uh, the Jesuit order, uh, since uh, St. Louis University was founded for Osages, um, and uh, a lot of Osage connections there. We were a lot more of us at that time. Um, as we moved west, uh, they... Uh, uh, commented on how in the morning the Osage, the whole village would come out and greet the sun. 
And uh, I, I saw that myself. I saw that in ceremonies, but I saw it when my father passed. And my grandmother, who lived with us, that was her son, and uh, every morning she would uh, start with a morning star and then go with the sun and just mourn and cry. Um, and our people say, uh, uh, w the gates of heaven are open, they say, uh, four times a day. They say at sunrise, at noon, sunset, and midnight. So that's why you see us... Uh, Sometimes ceremonies at midnight, we'll, we'll make tobacco, we'll make smoke, we'll do prayer. Uh, and sunrise uh, ceremonies, we'll use cedar. And uh, the, the old folks say cedar, they say, that takes care of the unseen elements of your being. Grief, stress, like that. That's how they would say that. But you've got to put prayer in it. Because cedar doesn't really know uh, itself. And, and you got to, if it's going to carry your petitions to heaven, you got to put your prayer in it. And then they'd always say, the, the way we know if you're sincere is if you're crying about it, if it makes you cry. That, that's the level that they would go to. So when they would see that, that son, uh, they would, uh, the, the whole time, I had a cousin one time say, uh, uh, and he's part of this ceremonial world. He, he goes, uh, so uh, we're in a sweat lodge, and he goes, uh, so we're going we're gonna to pray and do this part of the ceremony next. I said, yeah, that's, that's at sunrise. And he goes, he goes, well, what time would that be? And I said, Ira, they didn't have watches and clocks back then. These are younger guys are in there. And I said, uh, I said it's, it's when that sun hits that horizon and that, that time of the disk uh, and when that clicks off, you're end it, and and then and don't try to, you know. And you gotta. There's a lot of teachings in there. They always say, uh, don't put yourself into this ceremony. You just put it in order, start it up like a, it's like a clock watch. Everything kind of moves and get out of the way. Because uh, you put yourself in it, you're gonna mess it up. Because these uh, sweat lodge uh, heat in there is dangerous. So don't do it be, someone comes along here and said, I'm Mr. Indian Medicine Man. And you'll see that. Uh, I have a sweat lodge somewhere out in the country. There's a lot of charlatans out there. You better check out who it is, because you can hurt people that way. So I run uh, sweat for my families for 20 some years. And, and so I got, had good training. And those, those people, the older people, when they train you, they're strict about it. And uh, for example, we got to use flint, and uh, and they said, well, I said, what if we didn't use flint? They said, well, we'll tell you what happens. These old 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 men old men come out there. They can tell whether you use flint or not. Uh, they just have that gift. So you will see um, when you uh, read and study some of you anthropologists and others out here about the Osage. You'll see a lot of these highlights. But I want to emphasize that when you see and read about it, or you hear about it, and how we always turn to the son, to uh, grandfather, we call him grandfather, we're not praying to the son. And that really irks me and others when they say, oh, the Osages are talking to their God, the son. That's not how we look at this. We, we look at the sun and the moon and the stars as, and the earth and the cedar, and all these elements as God's staff, as they say. This is God's staff. And they say, you're too small to talk to God directly. Because you don't understand what that means. You know, that's wakanta. See, it's uh, everything. You're too small. So you have to go to those persons, that God's staff, and those, especially those great persons, that grandfather's son was created before any of us, and God created that son first. So you go, that son talks to God. So you go talk to your grandfather and put your petitions up to grandfather and ask grandfather, if you could hear the translation, they're saying, grandfather, take, take our prayers to God. So, so when you see him praying and blessing themselves, 
They're not, they're not saying that son, well, it's God. It depends what you, how you want us to talk, get into this. There's a philosopher at one of these tables over here. I was talking to him there, wherever he went. And uh, uh, it, it's not, it's not uh, Wakan and the Lakotas have the same language, the Sioux. The, Wakan is something sacred. So that tree is uh, Wakan, sacred. Um, and then you go to... Uh, to, uh, to you. Uh, you're Wakan. You're sacred. I'm Wakan. We're all Wakan. But when you say God, Wakan Tonka, so we shorten it to Wakan Ta. That's everything. Everything. That's God. That's God, Wakan Ta. So uh, that, you, you got to, that's maybe, you, some of you guys are saying, well, yeah, we, we, we do this every day here at the St. Paul's. We, we know all about this. And that's great. But you'd be surprised how many people don't get it. They try to put us in some sort of pagan uh, uh, trench and say, well, their time will, will go. How interesting. We'll, we'll write a book about it. So, uh, but it's, that's, this is the living spirituality of the Osage people. Now, Christianity, the Jesuits are pretty smart, I'm going to tell you. They, they said, well, uh, that's what Jesus, Jesus does. Uh, Jesus uh, will uh, take your prayers to God. And, and they fell right into that. So when you see the Jesuit orders uh, work, uh, there's, not, there's hardly any inconsistencies. So, uh, so that's uh, what the Jesuits, I just mentioned, there's time to change, change tunes or what? I've, I've met a few, they're pretty strict. Um, so, so is that... Evan, is that a bell telling me to hurry up? We have bells. We're getting dressed at a ceremony. No, no, you've, you've, got, you've got 20 minutes. Take your time. And we actually have questions. Yeah, yes. So we have three bells in our summer ceremonies. First bell, you better start thinking about getting your, your getting, we call these civilian clothes. Get out of these and head, head to, uh, to your camp area uh, and start, you know, get your stuff on packed. Second bell, you better hurry. Uh, and then third bell, we're ready to go. And so all the camps, you know, then all the, all the dancers start heading there after third bell. And, and it's that tone, too. I don't know where you got it, but it's, it's that same bell. So, so we, have, we have that philosophy. And so um, there is one ceremony. I'll, I'll just, just kind of st stop on this part. There it looks like a, like a turtle. Uh, out there, it's, in, it's cement, and o only Osages I know that do this. The others make them out of earth, but it's cement, and it's got uh, lines across it, and on the outside, on their side, is a sweat lodge toward the. It depends which clan you are, the east or west. But anyway, nevertheless, the point is this mound, and this mound, uh, they say, uh, represents all knowledge, and that you can learn. So if you knew what everybody in here was thinking and doing, what they're going to do, what they, you know, if you knew what every person on earth, they would explain it, I'm shortening it here, but if you knew what every insect on this planet was doing, and if you knew about the stars and the moon, and you understood the movements of everything, and you knew how to do everything, and you knew all about how it got there, you would know half of what there is to know. And that's that mound. You would know the whole mound. But it's not a mound, it's a globe. And you can't see underneath. And the only way you're going to know anything there is after you get on the other side of the sun, after you die. So, so that's the philosophy. No matter how much you try to learn and know, and they encourage you, you're never going to know everything. So to know the mind of God, they, people, is just, just a bridge too far and far and far. And I've seen the people talk to the grandfather, fire. They, uh, they call it betze. They call the grandfather fire. And, and they, they can track that from the sun to the sweat lodge, you know, to the sacred fire that some of our ceremonies they put together. And so when you're little, uh, they, uh, the old, old timers, you'll see some of us still do it. They'll, uh, some of them pick up the eagle feather and, you know, a lot of people don't like that, because that shouldn't do that. But people do. Other tribes have influence. 
That's how they do it. But Osage, you touch the forehead to uh, get the good thoughts that person had in their life. And then you go touch, touch their hands to get all the good, good feelings, all the work and all that part. Of, and then you, 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 you tr touch their heart for all the good feelings. So you can do that how you will do it. I personally just do it left to right. That's just me. And then you bless yourself. And, uh, and they, they follow that. Um, and uh, that's big stuff. Um, so... Uh, Anyway, uh, it's, um, it's a way of life we're trying to keep. And within that way of life, we are trying to understand how to treat each other better. And uh, we have, when we, we put people in the ground, uh, we are now, I was talking to a table over there about our struggles with um, cremation, how we... Uh, conduct these ceremonies. But I had some really good advice over there about how to view cremation as just another way of going into the ground. And so why don't we do this one ceremony before we do the cremation? And I'm going to go talk to Mogri Lookout and Eddie Red Eagle and some others about that. Because to us, that's kind of a new phenomena. And uh, I mean, how do you, because the, the four rites we, we've kept are the simple ones. Put a, put a blanket around or shawl around the, the person, put an eagle feather in there, uh, and then, uh, then we use cedar before we go eat, and then we have the meal. And oh, by the way, um, on point with the movie a little bit, uh, we used to put a lot more than one feather, but we got to put that feather in. But we used to put uh, their finest jewelry and others, but as the movie will show you, uh, people were breaking into our graves and robbing us. So we, uh, we decided to not wear anything, you know, jewelry or anything like that, and just use that feather, just a blanket or shawl, and that feather, and then, uh, and then after everyone comes back from the gravesite, uh, use cedar, the, the, I guess you call them deacons. Uh, they, they would take the eagle fans and, and cedar, and then you sit down, for that last meal for the deceased. And then the three that we've set aside, uh, for the most part, is uh, the paint that we do in the, the last day of sunrise. That makes some adjustments there. Uh, and then the uh, tobacco. T tobacco is real big with us. Um, as you'll see in the movie, uh, it opens with. Uh, one of our people, Tali Redcorn, uh, has a sacred pipe, which is um, uh, part of that universe I'm talking about. And they, they're burying it. They're burying it because they realized they couldn't conduct all these ceremonies because people were just gone. So they, they buried it. like a per It's a person. That pipe's a person. Like our drums. They're persons. Sacred drum. Not any old drum, but sacred drums. They're persons. And so they're part of this Wakan. This, this, uh, how you want to deal with that, but uh, so they, uh, uh, so anyway, they're, they're, they got that uh, that tobacco. And if you do that, you do that tobacco. You got to have a ceremony four days later, and you know people travel from California, Texas, whatever, for the funeral of their loved ones. They just can't stay around week after week. You know, they got to get back to work. And then finally, we used to have. Uh, don't see it hardly any at all anymore. The cedar stick, uh, uh, my brother makes them, uh, cuts them, and they put a red ochre on them, put them there at the head of the grave, and uh, that represents the flame of eternal life. So, and then you, there's a way to use that. So these are things we're trying to maintain, and that came from when we lived here. Uh, some people say, well, you know, we brought this, we brought that, uh, but we had a lot of different ways. Uh, ways, lots of different ways, but so did other tribes. So did other tribes. Cherokees. Uh, Quapaws used to be Osages, but they uh, said, uh, we're going to go live over here. You guys stay over there. <laughs> so, okay, we will maybe. You know, you're, you're the nice Osages. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> okay, that was an inside joke. <laughs> 
So, so, uh, so they're, they're, they used to, used to be Osages. So uh, anyway, uh, what we're trying to do is find the balance. And, and what, where we come up short is in education, uh, financial uh, literacy, as you may call it. Can you imagine uh, people, 1920s, having the a cash equivalent of today's money of over $400,000 each, um, tax-free? Uh, that's a family of four, 1.6 million a year. Um, um, having that kind of money, uh, but not understanding what currency is, uh, and then having the federal government uh, appoint trusted lawyers and former judges and businessmen as your guardian. And as David Grand points out in his book, he knew he was on a story when he see the guardians and the list of wards they have. Is, uh, it says uh, people in the prime of life strike them out as dead, 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 dead. It's just impossible for that many. The book and the movie are about one the most notorious murdering over there in Gray Horse community, but they were throughout our people. And uh, it happened for a long time. My personal family did not have uh, anyone um, uh, murdered in my direct line. Some relatives, yes, but not direct line. My grandfather, uh, in the movie, Arthur Bonacastle was serving a term as principal chief. My grandfather, Fred Lookout, did a lot of... Uh, time in, as chief during that time period. My grandmother, Mary Lookout, was his um, translator. And she, she told, I, I asked her, I mean, we didn't like talking about this horrible time. Uh, and she didn't like talking about it either. But I said, uh, why, how, why did uh, you all get spared? You, know, you were in your 20s, Grandma, at the time. She goes, well, my father had... Uh, uh, bodyguards from Chicago, and they were outlaws, and and one of them, they're good-looking men. She said, <laughs> so they come in there, and after they made the the business deal, my grandma translated it. Uh, she goes, that man, and, and my my thinking it was probably a young John Dillinger, uh, said, don't you worry, Chief. Uh, once uh, all these outlaws around here find out that me and my boys are your bodyguards, you're going to have no problems. We never had a problem. But that was the state of the world. When you had to go hire known killers and outlaws, you hire them as your protection because the police and the system. As David says in his book, um, it was not uh, who was complicit, it who wasn't complicit. Now, to this day, the apparatus that has uh, set all that up to a great extent still exists. Uh, uh, you have to be a lineal heir now, 1978, took that long, to uh, inherit an Osage head right. To this day, of, um, a fourth of the head rights are no longer uh, owned by tribal members, they're owned by others, and um, that's another story. And uh, of my 25,000, almost 25,000 Osage people, only 6,000 have any share of the oil and gas. The rest have nothing. So um, we have uh, those financial issues among my people, but there are so many oil companies, I can point out to you, that multinationals that started there in the Osage, and uh, uh, we just weren't prepared. And we trusted the, the federal government. That was a big, big mistake. So um, we have to learn how to be self-sufficient, have to educate ourselves. Half my people don't live in Oklahoma. Other people live in Oklahoma City, Tulsa. We've got to try to create a world through use of uh, developing internet, developing housing, uh, uh, security, health, all those issues that all communities face. Uh, we, we, have to, we are approaching these with urgency because we know what it's like to be taken advantage of. And uh, even then, when you're prepared, items like the pandemic, we didn't expect it hit by smallpox. We didn't expect nine out of 10 in one lifetime would be gone. So we've, we've made it, and we're, we're grateful for it. We're grateful that we had at least some of these advantages other tribes didn't, but with the 
advantages come the terror of, of the 1920s and 30s that you are reading about and that you will uh, see in the movie. Martin Scorsese gave us an opportunity to tell our story. It wasn't a Hollywood story. It's a true story, but it's not a cop story. It's a story about people. And that's what Martin Scorsese does. He takes the book, and, which is a great book and great research, and he, he makes it full of people. And, and as, as he says, it's a story about trust and betrayal on two levels. That's why I asked him, I said, how are you gonna approach this movie? He says, it's a story about the trust that a, a woman had in a man from the outside world and the horrible betrayal because he was murdering uh, all her family and he was giving her poison and they had children. And then it was about the trust the Osage people had with the outside world. And I'm gonna show about the development of that trust and the, the horrible uh, betrayal of that trust. And he does that. Uh, and I uh, really welcome your interest, but I do want to let you know um, we have our ways. And uh, as my senior advisor, J the late Johnny Williams said, when I said, Johnny, uh, you go down and you sit with these people uh, when they're making the movie every day. That'd be your job. Well, they, they come in there, they turned our streets to uh, dirt streets, and they created that world. And they're just wonderful people to work with. We're, and all my Osage people are working behind the scenes on clothing and everything else. And the language, Robert De Niro, really, man, the guy's got it down. Uh, but so, so, so uh, does Leonardo DiCaprio and Lily Gladstone. Uh, uh, she uh, is Native American, not Osage. She was telling us, she went to four months of, of in my language people, of crash courses, immersion. She's really good. So uh, this story uh, had to be told, but it's our story being told. And our people are, are in front of the camera with extras, and we're behind the camera too, uh, learning from the world's greatest people. And they're nice, good people, just like you folks. So any questions? Thank you. We've got time for one or two questions. Time for one or two questions. Alan. Thank you for being here. Um, I loved hearing your story. And I love your uh, goal towards sustainability. Can you talk a little bit about how you're trying to preserve your culture with the young? Well, our, our people say to know these ways, you have to uh, practice them. And so we, we all have uh, children, grandchildren, that they're, they're b busy, and they say, hey, we want to learn something like that. Would you record something for an hour? And I was just like, you know, that's just, that's not, that just doesn't work. To, to know these ways, you must do them. And, and so we're encouraging our people to participate, and, and that, that happens. And so uh, that's how we're doing it. We're just getting our people to just participate. Uh, so... Uh, there's some ceremonies that are not gonna get a lot of participation. This one sweat lodge, we have two different kinds. But the one where you, you use flint in the morning and, and you uh, cre create this uh, vortex of wind and heat and limestone rocks for two and a half hours and you get in there and bring them in there and you sweat and you do pr uh, prayers and all that. Well, you also drink uh, poison. And it's a mild poison, but you have to know how to allocate it and uh, it causes uh, a reaction, which is counted on, because we drink water and all that. So I was actually one of my uncles, Uncle Smokey, uh, and I said, Uncle Smokey, uh, every time we get ready for this spring sweat, all these Osages say they want to be here, and I'm, th I'm all worried about, I, was, I, was, I took over running it in those days. I'm always worried about it being too crowded, because we can kind of pack in about 12 in there, and. Uh, but God, we went, I said, your father, he, I seen him do back-to-back, uh, -back, and I can't do that. I, I mean, your dad was uh, stronger than me. I can't do that. And uh, he goes, oh, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. So here it comes. I'll worry about it, right? And uh, same thing, same 12 guys. And I was just like, uh, how come it's always the same people? And he goes, you got to understand, uh, telling people to come out here at 4.30 in the morning 
and get up there and heat those rocks and get in here the extreme heat and then having to regurgitate. He didn't say it that way. Uh, he goes, that's just not appealing to some people. <laughs> and I go, oh, okay. I didn't have to worry about it after that. But, but you know, my nephew, you know, I have sons and nephews. About one out of every four will go that far. One out of every five or six sometimes. But uh, when it comes to our Ilonska, we'll have, uh, in the summer, we'll have three districts. We'll have 300 men, 300 women dancing. Um, we have... Um, uh, just our, during the winter, we have someone has a birthday, we'll have a little dance there for their birthday. Uh, they want to do that. And so it just, it's just incorporating, uh, in our time, those ways. First thing I did, though, when I was chief 10 years ago, was put uh, any of this, we have small casinos, we're rural, but we, we take that money and we rebuilt our three arbors and community centers and our chapels. So now... Uh, you'll see, it took, took 10 years to complete that, those projects. You'll see brand new, large, huge dance arbors. You'll see uh, all three communities. You'll see three community centers and th three chapels. And so, um, so and then we're trying to encourage our people to come back. And that's where the infrastructure and broadband and, and all, uh, internet and all that comes in. And finding good people to manage it and who want to work as a team, to work together. So um, that's what it's about. Um, it's teamwork. It's what it's about. Let's say thank you to Chief Standing Bear. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.